So, I'm single, and I have been for a long time. It's a complete mystery why. I value my solitude, so I'm usually content with this. Sometimes, though, I'll admit, loneliness does creep up on me. When that happens, I make sure to think about why I would actively want to look for love. And I have a suspicion that it comes from my addiction to love stories. Stories about people falling in love at first sight, or accidentally falling in love without having to fish through a pond full of wiener heads on a dating app, are just so convincing, you know? They represent love like something that happens to people, striking them when they least expect it. Even the language that we use to describe this process is passive. We fall in love, essentially tripping into it the same way that we would land in a sinkhole. In reality, the process of falling in love with someone is going to involve some degree of choosiness. We all have some criteria that we use to rule out certain partners from others. Like, even if you lock eyes through a fish tank, I highly doubt that you would be comfortable with your date suddenly doing inexcusable things to their mashed potatoes the first time that you met them. The thing is, talking about being single is tricky, because single people have three modes. Incel, hashtag forever alone, and plucky, thriving divorcee. But talking about romance is almost harder in some ways. There are so many widespread assumptions that go completely uninterrogated about how love works that most people don't really have the tools at their disposal for explaining its mechanics. Well, that's not entirely true. Incel communities have developed this elaborate vocabulary to describe their lack of love. It's interesting to me the way that incel communities point to specific pieces of media that made them take the black pill. What does this media teach them? Well, for one thing, if you lock eyes with a woman and she looks back at you, you have fallen in love. If you're a strapping young lad and she is a hot wench, you are a match. These guys talk endlessly about their appearances, because they're searching for the variable that seems to have precluded them from this strapping lad hot wench equation. They hypothesize that the reason why they haven't been chosen by the gods to fall in love is because they're chubby or bald. The people who get love are hot and it improves their lives, so clearly they're deserving of it. An incel's life has not been improved by the curative power of love because the world has unfairly decided that he doesn't deserve it. So clearly, by a biased process of elimination, the people who don't get the love they're owed are the losers. Think about classic Disney movies. The villains are always people who just don't give a shit about love, they're ugly, or they're in evil, unrequited love with the protagonist. When people tell incels over and over again, be patient, it'll happen to you when you least expect it, they're overlooking that crucial premise. Love, supposedly, comes to those who meet the criteria to qualify for being in love, like being a hot, good person. And incels, by virtue of their inceldom, have decided that they were unfairly disqualified from the thing before they ever had a chance. So, I can kind of relate to incels in that way. They lose me at the misogyny and the racism. After a while, I start to feel like, where's that good thing that I was promised? I start to think that I've fallen through the cracks. Because I haven't discovered true love like couple 3017, a perfect relationship, as you know. Maybe... I'm not worthy of it. If I was worthy, I would at least have something small to show for it. Like, I don't know, the love of my life? At this point in my life, I've started to think that popular representations of love that depict it like it's ultimately out of our control, like it's fated to happen, are too simplistic and a little dangerous. There are two reasons for this. One, it robs everyone of their agency, both single and relationship people. We're not amoebas, we have thoughts and stuff. And two, it misleads everyone into thinking that love is less complex than it is. I'm following in the footsteps of people like Bell Hooks, the best person actually, who argues that Everyone wants love, but we remain totally confused about the practice of love in everyday life. In popular culture, love is always the stuff of fantasy. All the great movements for social justice in our society have strongly emphasized a love ethic. I want to know about the meaning of love beyond the realm of fantasy, beyond what we imagine can happen. I want to know love's truths as we live them. That's what I want to think about in this video today. Love's truths as we live them. And I'll be doing that by looking at movies. <laughs> I'll be taking two samples of straight people love stories, and I'm gonna think about how they represent falling in love. It's gonna be super white and straight and American, because that's one bias in English cinema. So if you notice that this could be more nuanced, congratulations, you noticed a YouTube video has flaws. Okay, so, the Kissing Booth trilogy. Noah, popular hot guy, can't date spunky hot girl Elle because, oopsie, Noah's brother Lee would disapprove. Noah and Elle are inexplicably drawn towards each other after 17 years of platonic friendship. Look, I don't know what all this means, 
I just like hanging out with you. And so in, they're just horny. And so they decide to date in secret. <laughs> Eventually, Lee comes around and approves of their relationship, and that's because obviously they're soulmates. And the soulmates thing, I guess, is just simply based on hotness, because these two don't actually have anything to bond over. And in fact, Noah frequently flies into inconsolable rage and jealousy. The coral! If it seems like other people are flirting with her, or if he's just caught her in kind of an awkward situation, or if he just hasn't told her how he's feeling and he expects her to read his mind. In the second movie, it's a distance that drives the wedge between them. Noah can't understand Elle because his ears are never in frame. Noah moves away for school, and Elle reasonably thinks that he's cheating on her, so she just cheats on him in advance just to head him off. While they do kiss and make up by the end of the movie, Kissing Booth 2 reinforces over and over again that Elle and Noah take solace in talking to anyone else but each other. And after two hours of juvenile miscommunication and squabbling, when Elle says, It's you, Noah. It's always been you. It's extremely dissatisfying, because even they can't explain why they want to keep this relationship going. This statement can only make sense if you agree with the film's premise, that love strikes you inexplicably, almost like it's ordained by random kissing booths, and if you ignore the weirdness of its conclusions, that love conquers the red flags that your angry, emotionally manipulative boyfriend carefully lays at your feet. In the third movie, the couple fight for like 45 minutes over really silly shit, even for this series standards. You're actually gonna go? I mean I made you dinner. Noah breaks up with Elle, like, kind of for the third time. This time, it's because he feels that Elle doesn't know herself well enough to choose a university without centering her decision on him and her relationship with him. In the end, they've taken a few years apart and they go on a motorcycle ride together, which, in the context of this series, implies they've gotten back together. When people talk about Kissing Booth, they have a tendency to conclude that it's bad because its characters are unlikable and the relationship it depicts is dysfunctional. Probably we can all agree that art should be able to explore frustrating relationship dynamics without being shit awful, though. I think the trouble arises from the dissonance between the narrative and the film's affect. That is, the atmosphere that arises out of the interplay between the film's collective formal elements. You could just say vibe, but it's not quite as much of what a smarty pants would say. Even though Noah and Elle are not really good for each other, each of the films insistently represents their relationship in such a way that suggests that you should think they are good for each other. After Elle and Noah basically create problems for themselves in their relationship and seem generally miserable for having to be in a relationship together, triumphant love songs play when they make up and when they make out. Even though they don't get along, the camera spins around them in ecstatic, rhapsodic excitation during their first kiss. Elle and Noah get lines like this. It's you, Noah. After three movies where Noah and Elle break up and get back together like 50 times, where they snap and take snide shots at each other, instead of having a simple five-minute conversation to clear up misunderstandings, and where they can only get emotional support from people they're not in relationships with, I just feel like I'm running around like a crazy person. As far as living with Noah in Boston goes, oh gosh, how much time you got? As much time as you need. <laughs> Kissing Booth 3 closes on the same saccharine, sentimental note as its predecessors. I think that possibly the, the series' overabundance of sickly sweet music, its script drips with Elle's boogery gushing about how compatible she is with Noah, all of that's discordant with the overarching narrative. The audience is clearly intended to relate positively to the couple on screen. We're supposed to believe that Elle and Noah's love is something special and unspoken, that their feelings are so potent they can cure Noah's neck pain after he bends like a brachiosaurus to give Elle a big wet smooch. Because this movie is trying to sell you love. The brand, like Nike's checkmark or the Kardashians' cards. The films build towards particular feelings that you can associate with romantic love. They're making you do all the work for them, even if the product of your labor contradicts the information that's provided by the narrative. The affect here is lovey-dovey. By all accounts, the films are depicting an alarmingly unhealthy and unpleasant relationship, and they're doing it while cloaking the unpleasantness and feel-good stuff. If you want an example of pure manufactured synthetic affect, look at the kissing booth's overuse of the cute montage. Ah yes, romance, or possibly a commercial for genital medication. You decide. 
These scenes collect images of couples being couples and shove them down your throat, laser focusing on touching, petting, and smooching only after they've evacuated these things of specificity. Romantic affect, the evocation of the good feelings that you've been yearning for, sells really easily to a crowd of lonely people. And can I just say, just let me say this, don't interrupt. I hate this lover's montage garbage. I hate it so much. In a story where the whole point is to watch two people connecting, why, kissing booth, do you just show inaudible giggling and kissing? Whatever's going on here is generic. This could be perfect couple 27, 536, or 7091. The reasons why people can be compatible are complicated. Whether their beliefs are the same, they both are in search of similar experiences, they have economic motivations, or they just like having deep conversations. I don't believe that love is some magical thing that strikes people at random moments when they least expect it. I think it's actually more boring and mathematical than that. Media like the kissing booth sell a form of love that doesn't need to be explained, and in fact, the romantic affect is intensified when it isn't explained, and the lovers are left to their happily ever after. Happily ever after is a misnomer. We can assume that couples fight, they go through major rocky periods and huge conflicts, even if they're together for the rest of their lives. A happily ever after implies this kind of conflict just doesn't happen again, to this scale or otherwise. It implies that their love is so powerful, because it's love, that it can overwrite any conflicts they get into in the future. And so, those conflicts are so uninteresting and so not worthy of notice that we don't even need to acknowledge they, that they're there! And that's wild. Like, never underestimate the power of arguing about who does the dishes. That shit ruins marriages. And so the happily ever after is more like a dishonest ellipses. It doesn't imply that the couple will have to recalibrate at some points. It implies that their pure, true love has climaxed and entirely erased any bad feelings. So in spite of the avalanche of love stories that I subject myself to from time to time, I absolutely hate them. They never seem to acknowledge the flaws in the relationship itself in any meaningful way. They always have montages glossing over the bonding and embellishing on the touchy-feely parts in really generic ways. And then there's always a happily ever after. Now look, these movies might be capturing something authentic about human relationships. That's fine, I'll accept that. What I don't like about this way of representing love is that it's lazy and potentially harmful to our psyches when it's basically the only way that we represent love. I think the difference between a relationship and a story that is recognizably a representation of a human relationship and one that feels like a real human relationship is texture. Smooth and rough patches that are part of the fabric of the relationship. So, par exemple. The Before Trilogy, a love story which I will say is for single people, addresses my three biggest complaints about love stories. Directed by Richard Linklater, with the first film releasing in 1995, Before Sunrise follows two young people, Jesse and Celine. The film starts by looking at a different couple, though. This middle-aged couple argues in German, and then Jesse sees Celine, and he's like, oh my god, this is the perfect icebreaker. Do you have any idea what they were arguing about? Do, do you speak English? After chatting and hitting it off, Jesse asks Celine to wander around Vienna with him while he kills time, waiting for his plane the next day. And what happens next? They talk. The film just follows them talking. Wait, wait. All this mundane, boring thing everybody has to do every day of their fucking life. <laughs> well, I was going to say the poetry of day-to-day -day life, but, you know, you <laughs> say the way you say it, I'll say the way I say it. I like that. Jesse and Celine converse, they flirt, they get a little touchy-feely, and they talk some more. Um, do you believe in reincarnation? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, it's interesting. It is utterly mesmerizing to watch. Because this, this could be a home video or something. These people are flawed, they have super specific histories, interests, and fears, and neither of them has weird freakouts in parking lots which we're supposed to interpret as romantic. And they are dreamy hotties, look at them! I like hearing Jesse and Celine talk with each other about, like, their childhoods. I mean, my parents are just these two people who didn't like each other very much, who uh, decided to get married and have a kid, and they try their best to be nice to me. Slowly, Jesse's walls come down as he reveals he's a big romantic softie and not actually some cool heartbreaker despite the leather jacket. <laughs> you know, it's funny, people always talk about how uh, love is this totally unselfish, giving thing, but if you think about it, you know, there's nothing more selfish. Hello, I just woke up with you. Jesse's actually still stung by his last romance, and he's a bit tentative about falling in love again. 
Celine is kind of worried that she's over-focused on love instead of her other dreams and ambitions. I always feel this pressure of being a strong and independent icon of womanhood and not making making look like my, my whole life is revolving around some guy. <sighs> Loving someone and being loved means so much to me. They talk about their thoughts, and the viewer gets to tune into their wavelength. And it's romantic as hell! Like, oh my god, there's this one moment when they're in this kissing booth together and they're listening to music and you just want them to kiss. 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 Touch hands right there in that booth, please. In the Before trilogy, conversation is plot. Richard Linklater has said as much, and there are great video essays on YouTube about this that you should absolutely watch. Hollywood films, and to some degree popular art criticism, have convinced many of us that all stories need to have a particular structure to them, like an inciting incident, a certain number of acts, and ugh, fucking rising action. But that's not the case. Not every kind of story all over the world is going to follow this formula. If you're not used to stories outside of that format, I think the Before Trilogy can offer you a comfortable welcome mat to step onto as you tiptoe out of your comfort zone. It trusts that you'll see something interesting in everyday life and normal-ass people, the film shows Jesse and Celine coming to love each other through interaction. You get the feeling by watching these characters that they're energized by being together because they're kindred spirits. They see things similarly, they like hearing what the other person thinks and responding to that. And the audience gets to know what's happening while they wander around and chat. They agree sometimes, they disagree, they have fun, they get sad and angry, they have good qualities that are redeeming and adorable, and flaws that are so obstructive they might actually destroy the relationship. This is the kind of stuff that gets glossed over in these cutesy montages. It's the stuff that shows Jesse and Celine's texture. Celine is bitingly, loudly contemptuous at times when Jesse's trying to be vulnerable if she's already pissed off about something. Romantic projections? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Romantic up there in the Ferris. Oh, kiss me, the sunset. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Jesse pretends to be more worldly than he really is, and at his worst, he's judgmental and cruelly sexist. You kind of get the sense that he does this when he's feeling inferior to Celine. Like, they have this one moment where Celine has her fortune read to her, and Jesse's really dismissive about it. I mean, that's, that's very nice and all. I mean, that, you know, we're all stardust, and you're becoming this great woman. I mean, but I hope you don't take that any more seriously than some horoscope in a daily syndicated newspaper. <laughs> It's totally weird, too. Like, you might think Jesse's just a skeptical person from this footage, but on the train where he met Celine, he tells a cute story about seeing his grandma's ghost. So I guess believing in magic is only okay in that context, hey, Jesse? Celine brings the incident up half jokingly, mostly passive aggressively. It's actually kind of rude. Jesse acts the way that he did before, but, well, giggling. So they skirt around the problem, and it's never resolved. In short, they ignore a core problem that arises through the way that they interact, which means. As much as their interaction is beautiful to watch, the whole thing could just implode. Their communication style will pose problems later, and it's gonna suck. That's important. It shows that romance is messy because people are messy. Love might not be able to conquer the people who are in love. And that's just the risk that you take when you get to know somebody. What's more, the film doesn't expect you to believe that the romantic cuddly bits are enough to conquer this toxicity. When Jesse and Celine kiss, they do this kind of half-kiss awkward hug thing when they have coitus. The soundscape and the mise-en-scene are fairly bare. No weird song plays beating into your head how you're supposed to feel about what you're seeing. So I'd say the affect here is peaceful, chill, loving in a non-plastic way. No erectile dysfunction commercials could compare. This is the kind of stuff that you'll never get from kissing booth type movies. First kisses, a lot of the time, are awkward. And they're kind of weird. They're rarely ever magical, you know? They actually kind of suck for the most part. You don't know whether you should go for the top lip or the bottom lip. Your noses bump into each other awkwardly and someone's breath is always just like kind of off. And you know what? That's okay. Love and romance can be awkward. And we're not being fair to ourselves by expecting that the loves that we find look as crisp and clean as Cirque du Soleil. Now, let's get to the meaty bits. Do these two end up together? Well, yes and no. In Before Sunrise, Jesse and Celine initially promise not to share information, and to never contact each other again. I know, it's tragic. They just want to let their romance be a one-night special memory so the magic of falling in love remains untainted by fights about dirty dishes. But they give. They really want to see each other again. 
and they decide instead to meet in that same place six months later without exchanging phone numbers god damn it and then the film ends people had to wait nine years to find out if these two would get together most people assume that they do of course because like how could you not after they had such a beautiful time together Before Sunset begins nine years after Before Sunrise, with Jesse nestled in a cramped Parisian bookstore, giving a talk on the book that he wrote based on that night with Celine. And I'm sorry to say, they are not together. Jesse went to the meeting spot at the time that they had agreed, but Celine wasn't there. Shortly after Jesse recounts their missed connection, Celine waltzes into the store, having heard Jesse was going to be in town. Jesse has to be on a plane in a couple of hours, but he's sensitive to his luck at having reunited with Celine after nearly 10 years, so he goes to lunch with her and begs her to wander around Paris with him and catch up for a while. And why didn't Celine show up? Her fucking grandma died! Marnie, you inconsiderate little piece of sh- After a while, they admit to each other that while they've lived their lives apart, they never really forgot about each other. What they could have had together, even if it wouldn't have worked out, has haunted them for a long time. Jesse decides to forget about his marriage and his obligations. He doesn't want to leave Celine, and the film ends with the pair lounging in Celine's apartment. Before Sunset feels like a response to Sunrise, like it confirms your worst fears about that ambiguous ending, that they didn't manage to be together, and they lost years that they could have spent kissing and holding hands. It courageously subverts expectations, if I do say so myself, because if you're used to the conventions of the romantic comedy genre, you've been trained to expect optimism from these stories. I interpreted the ending as a sign that they were going to be together. That's how these movies are supposed to go. Not with this pessimistic route where they enter their 30s without being married to each other. Bleh, gross. Okay, so I know I just said this is a pessimistic sequel, but truthfully, it's not that easy to sort out. I mean, they did meet up again. Those nine years that they weren't together weren't really wasted. They were full of life. Jesse has a son and a wife who he cheats on with Celine. Celine's an environmental activist. She's also been in relationships, and she's moved along. My favorite part of this movie is how imperfect their reunion is. There's some awkward moments when they flirt, like when Jesse pulls Celine onto his lap. Right there on a bench. Okay. No! Oh, come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's horrible. Make it go away. I've talked a lot about how Jesse and Celine are not perfect people, and I think it's important to reiterate they're also not perfect for each other. They're nostalgic and wistful, they're thoughtful and intelligent, and they like having deep conversations. So of course they yearn for each other because that's such a specific and unfortunately annoying combination of traits. Before Sunset makes this all obvious, it layers on a pleasant affect similar to Before Sunrise, and it presents the relationship as a genuine human connection, flaws and all. So, because you know things don't always work out the way that they do in magical romance movies, when Celine says, Baby, you are going to miss that plane. I know. Her words have a second meaning. Jesse could miss the plane of their relationship. Okay, so they must have ended up together this time, right? <sighs> well. In the third film, shot and set nine years later, Jesse and Celine are together. This is the closest the series comes to confirming that longing inside of you to see the two of them end up together. And this is also the film that crushes that dream. You think you're winning? We've caught Jesse and Celine at a bad time. They're going through some stuff. Not only are they dealing with some challenges, they are on a family vacation. Jesse is sending his son from his previous marriage back to the States, and Celine is contemplating taking a new job. Jesse wants to move Celine and their daughters to the US to live nearer to his son, which would pull Celine away from pursuing her ambitions. And they kind of, almost, maybe, break up here. I don't think I love you anymore. Before Midnight is my favorite entry in the trilogy. A lot of people say Before Sunrise is the perfect movie and that it didn't need sequels. That's the point! The point is that these sequels, and especially Before Midnight, unperfect Jesse and Celine's love. Before Midnight looks directly at the depressing reality that even in dreamy love stories like Jesse and Celine's, the magic can fade away and all that you have left is life. 
And that's exactly what they thought would happen when they were younger. They've become the middle-aged couple arguing in German on the train. The things that are straining their relationship are both new and old problems. Kids are a new problem, and knowing each other really well is a new problem. It's also kind of a charming new detail in their relationship. When Celine talks about how she's feeling, Jesse nods and says, I know you do, I know you are, sagely. Because he does know. Likewise, for Celine, Jesse's preoccupations with boobs are just completely legible. The old problems are almost exactly the same as when they first met. Jesse pretends to have a thicker skin than he really does. Celine's not very good at communicating when she's got a problem with something Jesse does. Celine and Jesse reluctantly go on a little romantic retreat, and at the tail end of it, they say they haven't had a chance to talk like this, like they used to, in a long time. This comment is sandwiched between an awkward dinner where Celine does that thing that some people do where they air out their grievances with another person in public. Is that today, after we drop Henry off? He tells me that even though I have an offer for an amazing job, he wants me to throw it all away and move to Chicago. That's not what I said. Can't you just wait until you're in a private setting? Why are you bringing this up for the first time over the lasagna? Anyway, it's sandwiched between that and the actual retreat, where Jesse and Celine just fight. Hello? <coughs> Guys, you're supposed to be having true love here. Can you just try to have a productive conversation? What kind of broke my heart while I was watching this scene was the revelation that they both may have actually cheated on each other. Like, can you believe that after they pined for each other for so long? Worst of all, there's friction developing over the way that Jesse's been publishing their intimate history in his books. Celine feels like it's violated her privacy, and Jesse reserves the right to publish books about having sex with Celine. <laughs> this can be hard to watch after you've invested, like, four hours and 20 years into this couple. You just want them to be happy after all that they've gone through, and they don't look happy. And I feel your pain, you poor son of a son. Their relationship is just one plate that they're spinning in the wider performance of their lives. They're balancing their careers, their hobbies, and raising kids with a romantic relationship, and that's extremely challenging. Plus, there's pressure. They have to make it work. They've got kids, money, and time tangled up in this relationship. They need to get this to work out. If it doesn't, everything they've sacrificed, all the time they've sunk into it, all the money, it's down the drain. This is the dark underbelly to relationships in the 21st century. The deeper you get, the further you go, the more disastrous the breakup will be. For these two, a stable life depends on them being together. If they end things now, it'll rock their lives and their children's lives, their friends, their future plans. All of it will just get messed up. And oh god, Jesse and Celine might be breaking up. Tons of issues that they had bottled up without ever talking about reach a boiling point and they start voicing old resentments. This is the answer to my complaint about happily ever afters. It can be a struggle to make things work, and they still never really agree to address these fundamental flaws in their relationship by the end of the film. So, when the camera zooms away after they kind of reconcile, part of you has to know. This could go either way. Love conquered time and space for them sometimes, and it also wasn't enough to keep them together at other times. At the same time, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't work out, you know? If you pay attention to this zoom, you notice that Jesse and Celine start to blend in with the handful of other couples sitting on the pier. This happens a lot in the trilogy, and I think it communicates that their story is just one of many. Life goes on, and so do we. This series shows a romance that is equal parts ridiculous, flawed, and beautiful. In each film, we're left with the question of whether or not this thing is gonna work out. Will Jesse and Celine finally end up together? And the answer every time? is maybe. The Before trilogy isn't a series about a perfect match that just works. It hasn't always been the two of them. It's not about showing people holding hands and selling it like that's what love looks like. This is a series about human connection, how awkward it can be, and how we can and should celebrate it for exactly what it is. I watch the Before films, and it never crosses my mind that, like, if there's someone out there for everyone, why can't I just have what couple 139 has? Have I fallen through the cracks? This kind of relationship. I have this with my friends, my coworkers, my family. Like, not the sex and the kissing, that would be unhygienic and like I don't like my grandma that way, but the awkward stuttering, the stuff that's left unsaid, the baggage, and the happy parts too, like the laughter, the coincidences, the good conversation, the fond memories. That I have. I complained earlier about the lack of representation of happy single people just vibing, and I stand by that. 
More than that, though, I also want more love stories that show complex relationships. We have to think about love a lot more, and we have to stop treating the concept like it's settled. The Before trilogy takes a step towards showing love's truths as we live them. I was under the impression for a while that finding love seemed like the ultimate form of acceptance. That's the way that it's sold in these movies anyway. It's just an automatic recognition of your worthiness. It works without anyone doing any work. And it's an inevitable endorsement that happens to people who deserve it. Which isn't true. Some people don't experience some kinds of loves even though we're worthy and deserving. We just watch a lot of anime and like our alone time, and we haven't met any people who we want to break that solitude for. And that has to be okay. There has to be more to life than having a fairy tale romance, because that's just one part of the human experience. And it can be just as flawed and painful as all the other things that we live through. I didn't show you what the fortune teller said to Celine earlier, uh, so take a listen here. You need to resign yourself to the awkwardness of life. Only... If you find peace within yourself, will you find true connection with others? Let's do just that. In search of true connection, resign yourselves to the awkwardness of life with me. Let's be cringe together. So this filly is going to keep on clapping through the world, a solo stallion, until I meet my horseshoe cobbler. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, sorry. Do you smell that? Oh, it looks like it's my patrons. <laughs> These people sent me money. <laughs> sent. And uh, here are their names. Odorous, Ben Hiltonen. Pungent, Cooper Jones. Smelly, Damien Mason. Stinky, Eric. Dank, Femi. <laughs> Musty, Joseph Abrams. Reeking, Josie the Riveter. Fragrant Pat Healy. That's a nice one, actually. Aromatic Sheldon W. Malodorous Shreya G. And Olfactive Thomas. <laughs> these, these people don't even get to sign off on what happens to their names.